Yeah, when you look at a, a piece of ground like that, for example, and, uh, uh, there are so many, not only points of view uh, from different people, but points of view to be taken by a developer, by a person who's going to come in here. I think that in this particular instance, developing that as a single piece is a, is a smart and proper way to do it. And the question then becomes, do you you know, try to maintain some of the existing structures? Do you wipe the ground? Do you, uh, do you build something new? Do you build something eclectic? You know, there's a million questions. Um, you mentioned Film Row. Film Row was the area that historically, uh, since 1920, was, and really into the 80s, was the place in Kansas City, and really for a two or three state area, where films were distributed to movie theaters. In an old system of film distribution across the country, there were 32 film exchanges. So when we first came out here and started renovating buildings and doing some of this, we came from that point of a small building owner preserving an individual building and preserving the uh, history and the integrity of the building and not just tearing it down. Uh, my first renovation project in the area was the uh, Commonwealth Theater Building, the 215 East 18th Building. It was vacant for three years. Uh, we bought it, we renovated it, we did it one small office at a time, and we ended up owning that building around say uh, 15 years and it was uh, uh, maybe not quite that long but it was full most of the time it became somewhat vibrant that was the old commonwealth building we put the screening room back in and the reason that building was vibrant was because the history of that building attracted so many people it was uh, we, we decorated with movie posters we talked a lot about film right um, Film Row became a part of a greater grassroots movement or a greater organic development, Crossroads. Crossroads uh, is really roughly defined as uh, south of Truman Road and north of Crown Center. And it, it was an area that was in its old use. Warehouses, uh, it, the trucks came and went, uh, it was where uh, Low-rise density, uh, film district in particular, had nothing more than a story with the exception of a couple buildings because of uh, the flammable nature of the old nitrate film. So about, oh, I'd say early 80s, there was talk and there was some discussion of knocking down most of the crossroads and building a sprint campus there, you know, to get them in Kansas City. Now, I don't think you would have found anybody that would have found fault with that. They would have said, do it, do it. Fortunately, uh, from, a, uh, from the perspective of the architecture, it didn't happen because there's a lot of great architecture in the crossroads. And I don't know of a better adaptive reuse one building at a time. I think that it, uh, the various tools like the Planned Industrial Expansion Authority, things like that, made that area what it is today. It would never have worked if the developer had a master plan. Now, cross Truman Road into the Power and Light District, and you have a completely different scenario. You have a different density, you have a different use, and quite frankly, I don't know that that was ever going to, quote, be reborn the way the crossroads was. It's too much density, the prices were not going to be as reasonable as the crossroads used to be. So, Clearing that probably was the right thing to do. Uh, am I a fan of, you know, stamped out bars? No. But I'm, am I a fan of the fact that we have a vibrant downtown? Yes. You know, I don't go to Westport anymore either, but it has old buildings. You know, I think it's for a different generation. Um, I think that uh, when you look at uh, redevelopment, you have to really weigh the importance of an old building. You know, as I said, my Commonwealth building was vacant three years. This Screenland building we sit in was vacant for a year and was effectively mostly vacant for nine years before. It was an old freezer facility. Uh, my Universal Pictures building was, uh, you know, empty when we bought it. Uh, my uh, uh, building uh, where Milton's Coffee House is at 19th and Wyandotte, it was burned in the fire and it had been effectively vacant or mostly vacant for 15 years. Every one of those buildings, everybody said, you know, terrible. Every one of those buildings we successfully rehabbed and we rented them up. And it's really much akin 
to bringing in a hundred jobs. I mean, that's how many people work in these empty buildings. So, I mean, it, it, and it was effective. And most importantly, you have, I, I think, five very nice, interesting buildings that tell a story. So, look at this piece of ground. It sets between the uh, Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts, Screenland, Crossroads, downtown, our life in blue. Okay, you look at this piece of ground. Well, the first thing to do is take a big look at, at the uh, block. Um, what have you got? Well, on the Washington Street side, you have uh, a single building. It was an old church built in 1900, two stories with a basement. It was another one of those buildings that was vacant. I bought it and renovated it. Um, it's a neat structure. It's brick, it's 100 plus years old, and uh, it's eclectic. But it's got vacant ground to the north, it's got vacant ground to the south. Now, on the corner, there was an old hotel, the Rosslyn Hotel. And many people will say they should never have torn that down. It was just torn down a year ago. I looked at that building, and it had some substantial problems. And I was questioning whether or not it was salvageable, you know. And I look at the next building to the east, those uh, apartments, they're beautiful, and they're in very good shape. I look at the building on the uh, corner of Broadway and 17th on the north uh, west side, solid building, nothing remarkable architecturally about it. I look at those tulips, which I think is a wonderful little restaurant, and then you've got a dentist. I think everybody's hands blew up when they say tear down the building. <laughs> yeah. you know, and you're promoting tearing down uh, the existing business, but architecture, there's certainly nothing uh, common about a dentist. So, you know, the question is, what does the landowner do with that? Well, I think the landowner is probably looking at some development that will take the whole block. Now, in the old days, I think they may have done everything to face the Performing Arts Center, put service entrances on Washington Street. However, I think that due to the nature of, uh, of the area, the crossroads area, I think that the, uh, the fact is that you could set up you know, utilize the existing little two-story building on Washington Street and then set up small storefront space, small restaurant space, small courtyard space, and use that to replicate a crossroads feel, a west side feel. And I don't want to forget about the west side. When I say screenland, we have the west side neighborhood over there. Um, utilize that ground to maybe uh, improve upon that or utilize that. And if you are going to uh, build new construction, build from the north along Broadway. Now, I'm a huge fan of the idea of building, but then building right over the top of and preserving those tulips. A, it's an interesting way to build something new. I mean, it's, you know, it's just not a usual way to build things. I don't think you have to knock down every single building you come across to develop something new. Um, certainly been done in New York and California, places like that where you literally build around something and maybe you build something you know structurally that you build right around and on top of and preserve these old buildings and, and to me that would be a fun and interesting way to do it now the question is you know what's the use there well, they talked about the music uh, conservatory moving there and that would certainly be a very appropriate use you should have students there who would be very, very at home in uh, you know, an arts district. They would be close to the Performing Arts Center and you can create a, a cultural you know, magnet of sorts. You know. uh, but you know, would they tear down the little existing buildings? They might. But then again, those two days would probably be a marvelous and wonderful little addition. So um, you know, do I think we have to preserve the building in that block? In this case, I would say the dominant nature of that block is the fact that it is um, mostly vacant. I think what that block is designed to do, and this is why the conservatory may not well be the fit there, that block is part of what's known as a TIP, the Tax Income Financing District for the Performing Arts Center. 
So whatever is there is designed to generate revenue from the art center, sales tax revenue for all the, uh, the ground improvements. So in that case, restaurants, you know, anything with high sales tax use is probably the preferred uh, use there. If, I, if memory serves me correctly, the Performing Arts Center actually technically owns the ground and co paying with developers and, you know, they're certainly as qualified as anybody in this town to redevelop a large, you know, redevelop a large project. I think the world of John Copagan and Keith and Paul, the father, and, and, and the company, they, they think they have a very good uh, uh, grasp on development, and I think they listen to people who say, hey, let's try something different. Uh, I certainly think that you should build something interesting, interesting there. And whatever it does, I want it to generate not only sales tax revenue that is put back into the local area, but I want it to be a service, or I think it should be a service to the west side, to the crossroads, and the performing arts center. I don't think it's going to be much, uh, if it has some really name restaurants, it'll be a service to the downtown area, it'll be a service to the metro area. But I think in this particular location, uh, you have to, uh, you, know, you have to look at what is the highest and best use of that land as it affects all things around it. It's a very rare case where I say, I wouldn't just take a, a, an absolute no to tearing down a couple of those buildings. Uh, and I think very long and hard about that. Uh, for example, on the Country Club Plaza about a month ago, you know, Seasons 52 was coming in, and they were locating a very uh, high sales tax grossing, revenue producing, traffic producing restaurant in the plaza. However, they were going to box over historic architectural facades. Well, in that particular case, the nature and the history of those facades outweighs anything, especially since there's an alternative. You know, there's, there's a way to incorporate it, and what Seasons 52 did was they incorporated the original facade. That was pretty easy. Here, you have to ask yourself, how can we incorporate the existing buildings and architecture? How can we find a use that serves the west side, that serves the crossroads, that serves the Performing Arts Center? In my observation, that use has got to be a commercial use and service. Um, it is, uh, it would be very, uh, uh, I, I think it would be inappropriate to put an office building there because an office building wouldn't fit, you know. You have too many opportunities for restaurant traffic. And if you are going to build a complex with restaurants, then I think you got to leave most two those where they are. They've earned that spot. They're a small family business. They're the perfect example of the people that have made and saved downtown Kansas City for 50 years. You know? um, so I, I, I think that one of the, you know, my observation is it needs to be uh, interesting, it needs to be a sales tax producer, and it needs to be something that respects the ground around it. So that means architecturally, it had better be significant. I mean, it is uh, uh, the Performing Arts Center is, in my opinion, the greatest single building put up in the city in a hundred years. And I don't know the ones I can right now. It is the number one ever for me. It is incredible. I mean, it is incredible in the way. It, addresses the land, addresses the neighborhood. You know, the only criticism I have is I think the parking garage uh, was a disaster as far as it's facing 17th Street. The only way to salvage that is to build, and maybe they're planning on storefronts along there that can have, uh, uh, you know, shops, restaurants, anything to create something that brings those two together. I think it, it, it sets too high, but you know what? I'll wait to see how that plays out. So that's, you know, that's kind of my take on the, on the setting on this uh, block. And I'm, again, I've been looking at that property for a number of years. Yeah, I was going to say, you're probably the most, one of the most qualified in terms of just proximity you've been. <laughs> you know, yeah, from, you know, when we bought. When you straddle, when you, you have, you used to own this building, you certainly own buildings in the crossroads. Yeah, no, and I, I'm very, I've been very conscious of, of, what this particular block mean? I mean, if you think about it, you got the freeway screen land on the block. Yeah. And when I bought this building, every it was ready looking across the street, ready looking here, ready looking everywhere. And you know, there was no good reason to buy a building like this. However, it 
it was in a proximity that I liked. Um, and I also knew that if I did enough here that and, and filled this building, which we did, then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you're going to have the building cat a corner and the building's down the street. And, and, and people come here, and all of a sudden, you go up the hill to 17 and there's a great restaurant. So, uh, you know, I look across the street and say, What do I want to see? You know, what, what, what do I want to, you know, obviously, I would love nothing more than something that matches the Washington Street facade of Screenland. You know, we, we took very due care in preserving the center part of this building and repainting it to make, you know, to make the brick. Uh, stand out in its original 1913 design, and then the additions we, you know, we did some things architecturally to give the streetscape. So I think you really need a streetscape, no matter what you do, even if they tear down everything and build uh, a new building. I think they need to create a streetscape. Well, that's particularly important along um, 17th Street corridor at this point. Um, Walk, I was watching people walk from the Performing Arts Center to wherever they were parked, maybe even the restaurants um, up the hill, and it was, it was a little rough, you know? Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, you know, they did a lot to clean up the streets, and Shirley Hellsberg did a marvelous job with her uh, renovation of the uh, uh, Warner Brothers building, I think they call it Patagraph, but uh, same thing, uh, and some of the streetscape. However, you know, what have you got on 17? You got nothing. You got, you know, but there's a perfect spot to put shops. Um, our, our building at 19th and Wyandotte, Mildred's was just packed Saturday and Saturday. And that's, that's a marvelous thing because this is a little small family owned business, you know, 1,100 square feet, that all of a sudden they're dynamically affected by a beautiful farming art facility. And this is what you want. Uh, I don't want, I mean, okay, Denny's is great, and Denny's is a national chain, but I'd much rather see people, and I think most people would rather go to the Mildreds. Um, we, we're putting in another tenant who will do frozen cocktails, so at night they'll have a nice, you know, reasonable little restaurant, place to get a drink, um, but for a performance, uh, Shirley Hillsbury's Webster House. Wow, what an incredible renovation. I mean, I think Shirley Hillsborough has done more for renovating historic buildings uh, because she's got a passion for it. Uh, I, I'd love to see her buy every building in that she can. And I think that this kind of synergy, this kind of foot traffic is just the thing that's needed now. Because you got to remember, the crossroads did well for a long time, but the last two years, it's challenging to find the financing to do these deals. It's challenging to, uh, to get new businesses to do a startup. And when you all of a sudden have thousands of uh, you know, uh, heels and toes going by, uh, this is the time to look at the uh, performing arts, uh, you know, in fact, on this property across the street. And that's what it was always designed to do. I mean, I remember leasing the third floor of this place, Tom, telling them, hey, believe me, you're going to see a beautiful, incredible structure after a moment. But it took a lot of faith on their part. So, you know, we all knew this was going to happen. Now the question is, how many performances do the performer numbers? You know, you've got to run the numbers, and you have. I, I know there are people that say we want a community center, and let's face it, DST did a rare thing. They put up a community garden over here where there was going to be an eighteen-story condominium, and that is an incredible thing to do because that was not a cheap investment, and that was an investment in making a great community space in the crossroads. But that isn't going to happen twice, I'm certain. That ground is being developed for two reasons. One is a commercial enterprise, but two, to feed and support the Performing Arts Center, which is going to need all the, the, the support it can get financially. So, uh, you know, I will certainly look at it with, with the, the one thing that would disappoint me is something that looked like a glass box with no architectural flair sitting there. You know, again, there's this country has become, and our nation has become endeared to boxes, Walmarts, Lowe's, Home Depots, and you know, corporate restaurants that have a particular brand, and you can find them on any corner. Uh, we need to make sure that we do, uh, you know, what we did a hundred years ago. We come up with architectural design, we come up with something that has a brand or stamp on it. 
you know, follow that, follow that passion for the architecture and be vocal about it. You know, that's the only way we got seasons 52 to change their, their plans, you know. Uh, so I think that whatever happens here, people have to keep an eye on it, people have to be involved in it. Uh, those people who feel that we shouldn't tear down the buildings, they should be vocal. Those people who feel that we should put something, you know, interesting there architecturally, which is what I think is going to happen, need to be vocal. Uh, I, but I also think it's extremely important, always, to face your streets with something that creates activity. Uh, I do believe that when a hotel, there used to be a proposal to put a hotel on the Air Center back in the 90s. And I will tell you this, had that hotel been built in 1994, what you would have had was a huge hotel with a big front to the downtown loop and loading docks coming in off of 17th Street, because that's all that was considered. It was, it was considered to be a uh, just a trucking area, nothing, nothing interesting. So uh, fortunately, we changed our mindset. You know, we we find it important for you. You're sitting in an old fish flavor, and you know, now it's uh, the lobby for a movie theater. You know, change with the times. Do you have any any questions for the, kind of? You're one of the rare people that. Can, the nature of the crossroads is low density, low lines. Right. And, uh, you know, I did say, I guess I said I'd, I'd hate to see an office building. I wouldn't mind seeing a tall office building on the north side of that property that, that gave more lunchtime traffic to that area and more lunchtime traffic to the crossroads. Now, in that case, I think what I would say is density on the north side of, of the uh, property in the form of a uh, of a of an office building, an interesting architectural office building that went low. And, and I did look at developing that property one time and talked to John about it. We were going to build a screen line there. And what we were going to do, and the, and the way I looked at it was, okay, from 17th to, you know, top of the hill, you'd want it one, two stories, lots of face, Washington Street, with 17th Street and um, uh, Broadway, of course, where you've got a lot of entrances from the street, a lot of reasons to be on foot. Uh, maybe coming in from the back on Washington Street with a couple of entrances for some parking that was incorporated like the plaza incorporates it. In other words, you don't build surface lots, you don't build, you build on top of your parking meter you on the ground. But if you have an office building up to the top side and they can feed down, uh, they're going to go not only to these restaurants, but they're going to walk down things like that. So I think with reserve, I think density is very important. And, it, and from, a, from a financial point, it's really important. Uh, the way I was going to develop this building, at least the plan that we had, um, I wanted it to be reflective a little more film row than I did just the crossroads in general. I like that Art Deco influence. If you go down 18th Street, look on Film Row, you'll notice two things, or three things about the buildings. One, you'll notice are two stories with the exception of Warner Brothers. That is because uh, they, you know, the fire, they didn't, they didn't want tall buildings to work as hard to exit. Two, you'll notice that there are all things from reconstruction because Prior to 1950, nitrate film was flammable. And three, you'll notice they're very Art Deco in their influence. MGM, Columbia, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, Public Pictures, Disney Company, Monogram, all of these companies, Fox, everybody, uh, were coming from the heyday of Hollywood, and that was the dominant architectural style of Hollywood, and that's what they did on their film. Moses built architectural terracotta brick. It was pretty easy to do. So we were going to, I mean, I actually wrote up a story. I made up a character who was sent in 19, I think, 39 to uh, manage the Kansas City office of Metro Golden Mayor. And he became so enamored with Kansas City that after his uh, job assignment was over in Kansas City, he stayed here and he decided to build a building that was going to be built in the Art Deco style, but he wanted to build a world of tomorrow. What he or what everybody in 1939 thought of as the influence 
and what the world would look like in, 19, in the year 2000. So we were going to have, we wrote a story about what he did to build it. And so as we built it, we were going to take phony pictures of construction going on, old style hats and old style cranes, and we were going to give the building a history that it didn't have. But in other words, you, you give that building history that it doesn't have. We had flags with the Screenland logos, and we had the, the broad art deco steps coming up, and we were going to use all construction, uh, construction methodology that you would have seen uh, in 1936. In other words, we would certainly use modern steel and modern art, uh, engineering, but we would, we would not use materials that couldn't be found available in 1936. Our elevator was going to be in the shape of a rocket that would you know, have lights, but we would have used LED. But the idea was, we thought about this as a global you know, uh, use of that land. And so the Screenland world, the world of tomorrow, the building that had a story and made people interested was on the south end. The dense part was on the north end of the feeding ground. How's that for a long answer to a very short question? <laughs> I guess well, one more is uh, with the west side and the interstate system that's been placed there and then the bridge. What's, what's your thoughts on that? Is that kind of a, do you view that as a setback in terms of creating a, a major divide between the crossroads and, and the west side? You know, have you guys had a chance to interview anybody from the west side? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Talk to Jenny, Mendez, and uh, Adam. Okay, good. Adam. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, you know, the West Side is such an unusual dynamic. Um, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a, quote, border war going on. Um, the West, you know, the freeway was definitely, I mean, the, the freeway was put into the courts. And to this very day, they resent the freeway coming in and carving their neighborhood in half. Um, they have remained very true to a, a dense Latino population. Uh, sometimes I, I find it necessary to remind them it used to be a dense German population and a dense Irish population. Because, of course, when I renovated this building, everything was great, everything was fine, and they would hold neighborhood meetings here. Well, when I, would, when I found that there was there were a number of tax abatement districts available to a lot of developers, but there were none for Film Row, there were none for Screenland, and we were all having our taxes just rise and rise and rise without protection, yet we were doing the same work. I suggested a planned industrial expansion authority district for this area, Washington Street, Film Row, and I met a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance. And at first, I just couldn't understand it. But what I came to understand was that the West Side felt that any new development, anything like that, was a threat to their ability to stay in the area. They felt that new condominiums and fancy new buildings would raise the values and raise their taxes, and they wouldn't be able to stay. They felt that their old houses, like the three old houses on Broadway, if you go just south of 18th, there are three old houses that certainly don't look like they fit on a commercial street like Broadway, but they are people who've been there 50 years. They, they did not want those taken away, as you can well understand. And so what I learned was, you know, with, with all of the things that we feel are, are great about redevelopment and great about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the vibrance of, of this area, uh, is really kind of a, a challenge and a threat to many people who live here. And I came to understand that and I came to, uh, you know, I worked with them and, you know, I had to really convince them that I wasn't there to, to redevelop their buildings or take things. I mean, we, we made our plan industrial expansion in 31 that has no condemnation rights. But it was designed for every individual small building owner to have a tool by which they may renovate their building, freeze their taxes, stay on par with everybody. A very necessary tool, by the way. Uh, tax abatement is not a dirty word, as uh, previous uh, mayor's administration may you know, let you think. Um, we can get a lot more rent going up there and developing a strip mall, you know, at 116th North or 
36 south. I mean, you know, there's uh, down here the rents don't, you know, they don't have as much density, and so you don't get as much rent. So if you get too much density, as Dave Ford would probably say, guys like Dave's uh, YJs could not stay in business, you know. They couldn't if they had too much density because the prices would go up, the taxes would go up, uh, the use would go up. Um, and one of the things that made this place popular is that artist population. So, uh, you know, again, I think that the West Side is a unique uh, example of people who are a little bit uh, afraid of, the, of um, not only development, but things like the highway, and the highway did split them in half. Steve McDowell, who's an architect in D&I and an architect in town, one of the best architectural firms in the city, really, um, he once suggested moving I-35 farther back so that you create a bigger bolt. Well, of course, on one hand, you could repopulate that loss, but on the other hand, then somebody else is getting the houses taken. So that didn't go to popularity. But yeah, I think that any time you're going to put, uh, you know, freeways or anything in the way, it does cut neighborhoods. And, you know, I think that you've got to be 